be with you this morning or whenever you're watching this throughout your week. Um, if you tuned in last week, you will know that we wrapped up our last series on answering the big questions about faith. And oh my goodness, that series was so cool. We looked at all of the big questions, well, some of them, like why is there suffering in the world if God exists? Or, or what evidence is are there for Christianity from creation, from the resurrection? It was um, a really, really cool series. And partly so we could answer when our friends or people we know have questions about the faith, we can feel confident in answering some of those things. But also for ourselves, some of us had questions as we do from time to time and it was really cool to be able to work through some of those. And if you missed out on any of those series, make sure to tune in on our YouTube channel because they're really worth watching. I encourage you to give them a look. And this week, we are starting a new exciting series, one that I am super excited about. And this one is called Know What You Believe. And it's all about understanding our statement of faith. And you'll notice we use a lot of tree imagery and our PowerPoints and, and our little, little snapshots about it. And so the idea is that as we grow deep in our understanding of who God is and his word and how all of that bigger picture stuff fits together, we'll be able to grow deep roots and be able to stand firm against all of the crazy winds that kind of come against us from from theories, from, from outside the faith, trying to tell us what to think and believe about things. We'll have deep roots planted in God's word and in good theology to be able to stand firm. And so I'm excited about this series. And who else is excited about theology? <laughs> I know it can feel a little bit intimidating um, using the word theology and thinking about big ideas. And, um, but I have good news for you. You're already doing theology. Whether you're tuning in this morning and you've been a Christian for a long time, or you're an atheist, or you're not sure, or, or maybe you're just um, not really sure what you believe on a whole lot of things, you are doing theology. Theology is simply a discussion and what you think about God. A.W. Tozer says, the first thing that comes into a person's mind when they think about God is the most important thing about that person. So you are all doing theology. And the question then we have to ask, if I already have a theology, if I already have thoughts and ideas about God, are they good ones? Are they ones that line up with scripture and reason and tradition and experience? And so that's what this series is all about, to equip you in understanding our statement of faith and how to apply it to your lives today. I hope you can join us. I'm really excited about this series, so let's get underway with part one. Kia ora, Agora Church. It's so good to be with you online this Sunday or whenever you're watching this. So uh, thanks, Sarah, for introducing our series. It's so exciting. Uh, so I'm just going to pray as we begin. Let's pray. So yeah, Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that you've made clear who you are in the scriptures. You've made uh, through the Bible, through the Word of God, you've made uh, revealed to us that you're, a, um, that you're Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that you're a Trinity, one God and three persons. And as we look into this statement of belief and look into these core um, kind of foundational beliefs of the Christian faith, I pray you teach us from your Word and deepen our faith and deepen our understanding of who you are, who we are and what, what we're here to do in this world. So yeah, just come... Uh, and uh, yeah, anoint your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. So this morning we're going to be uh, looking at th uh, three of the statement of faith um, uh, statement of faith for Agora Church. Um, and so the first one we're going to look at now is um, about the Bible. So it'll be up appearing here. Um, so the Bible, we believe that all scripture is infallible, divinely inspired of God, without error in the original manuscripts, and is the only true guide for Christian faith and practice. So let's have a look at one of the verses this um, doctrine is based on, uh, which is 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, which says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we see in this verse that all of scripture is God breathed, right? And since God 
as God and he cannot lie, he can't make a mistake because he knows everything, then it follows that the scriptures themselves that he's inspired are also infallible and without error in the original manuscripts. Um, and this belief actually gives us complete confidence that we can trust in the Bible, that when whatever the Bible says is true, is true, and whatever it affirms about salvation or what's right and wrong or how to live this life on this planet, then we can have full confidence that what the Bible affirms is true, is reasonable, and is actually the best way to live on planet Earth. So I think that's um, an important point. Um, also, the last part of the statement, I believe, is also very important. Um, it says, the scriptures are the only true guide for Christian faith and practice. You know, the scriptures um, are our final authority, and they should guide all our thinking and, and practice of Christianity in the church. Not just, you know, mere pragmatism doesn't guide what we do in church, right? Just whatever works, whatever gets people through the door. Uh, that's not how we base our Christianity and how we live our lives and how we do church, right? It's actually based on the Bible as the final authority. You know, one of the other options if, if we're going to do church together, well, we could, you know, or, or Christianity, well, we could just follow our heart or we could follow our feelings or we could follow what's popular or what works, but all of these are flawed. Scripture is the, is the true basis for not just what we think about the Christian faith, but how we do church, how we love each other, how we do mission, how we do everything in the Christian life and in church together. So, yeah, I think this first point of our statement of belief is hugely practical and hugely important and sometimes I wonder how often do we follow this you know we, we can pay lip service to scripture being our final authority and all we do in church but are, are we open to be challenged if some practice or some way we're doing things if someone comes and says hey you know but doesn't the bible say this or isn't this doctrine not quite following what the scriptures say are we open to actually um, listen to that and actually um, have our practices and have our traditions and have our um, beliefs challenged by what Scripture says. Um, and yeah, because it is the infallible Word of God. It's divinely inspired. So so yeah, that's the first point. Now we're, for the sake of time, we're going to move on to the, um, the last two points and look at them in a little bit more detail. So um, the second point is um, about the Trinity. It says, we believe in one God existing eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that these three are the one God, having precisely the same nature and attributes, but distinct in role and activity. And the third point of our statement of belief is to do with the Father. We believe that the Father is fully God, that his fatherhood is eternal and personal, and that he is the father of our Lord Jesus and of all who believe in Christ. So yeah, I really want to um, zoom in for the rest of the sermon and really expand upon and look more at the second point in a bit more detail about the Trinity. Um, so this is called the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's a distinctly Christian belief about God that there is three persons and one God. Um, and each member of the Trinity is co-equal and co-eternal. And notice in our statement of belief that the equality of the three persons is actually inferred by the fact that they have the same nature and attributes, um, but they are distinct in their role and activity in relation to creation. So what does this mean? Well, each member of the Trinity is involved in the work of God, whether it be salvation or creation, every member is involved. Now, one member may be more prominent than the others, but they're all involved in every, every, uh, every work of God. Take salvation, for instance. The Father sent the Son, and the Son, Jesus, became human and died on the cross. And then the Spirit applies this work of salvation by changing our hearts when we're born again and works in us to sanctify us. So you can see that each member of the Trinity is involved in our salvation. The Father sends the Son, Jesus came and died on the cross, and the Spirit sanctifies us. Um, see, many verses actually um, talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and apply equality to each of them. So let's look at just one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13 
verse 14 says this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So notice the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, all mentioned a, a kind of a triune blessing Paul gives at the end of 2 Corinthians. But it's interesting, isn't it, with this doctrine of the Trinity, because there isn't a Bible verse we can actually turn to that directly states the doctrine of the Trinity, you know, one God, three persons. And, but the early church found that it was the only theological construction that best fits the biblical data. For instance, um, the fact that Jesus is, is fully God, as well as the Father being God, is clearly stated throughout the Bible, as well as the fact that God is one. But how can the fact that Jesus is God and the Father is God, but there's one God, how can that be reconciled? Right? That's the question people have wrestled with. Um, and the early church certainly wrestled with. Um, now, some groups, including Jehovah's Witnesses, have rejected this doctrine, and other people have claimed we believe in a contradiction by believing in three persons but one God. However, theologian Millard Erickson, Millard Erickson points out that the doctrine of the Trinity is contradictory only if God is three at the same time as he is one, and in the same respect as he is one. The effort of Christian theologians through the years has been to discern the difference in God being one and also being, th also being three. So the key point Erickson is making here is that God is different in the way that he's one than the way that he's three. Um, in fact, it's interesting, the doctrine of, of the Trinity is actually unique to Christianity. No other religion has a doctrine that is close to resembling that. Um, the doctrine of, of the Trinity also sets apart Christianity from other monotheistic beliefs um, that also believe in one God like Islam and Judaism. So it's this unique doctrine, this unique mystery that us Christians um, need to wrestle with. Um, A.W. Tozer, amazing author, um, he wrote this. He wrote, the doctrine of the Trinity, as I've said before, is truth for the heart. Right? It's truth for the heart. The fact that it cannot be satisfactorily explained instead of being against it is in its favour. Such a truth had to be revealed. No one could have imagined it. Right? No one could have dreamt the doctrine of the Trinity up. Uh, and there's no, none of the other religions have anything vaguely resembling it um, because God has actually come and revealed himself as a triune God to us through the scriptures. That is how we arrive at it. Um, and as I said before, how do we arrive at it? Well, the fact that Jesus is God, that the Father is God, um, and, and we see in a sense that the Holy Spirit's God as well. Not as many scriptures about that, but certainly some. Um, and then we see the clear teaching that God is one, and so we have to hold these two truths, that God is three persons and one God. So, let's look at some attempts to explain the Trinity. It actually took the early church a few centuries to really clarify and fully form the doctrine of the Trinity. And on the way, they encountered several inadequate explanations or heresies in this journey. Now, when I say it's not that the, the doctrine of the Trinity isn't there implicitly in Scripture, because it is. You know, like I said, it's very clear from the Scriptures that Jesus is God, right? It's very hard to deny that. But the problem was, how do we reconcile? We believe Jesus is God, the Father is God, but yet we believe in one God. That was, that was what the early church had to wrestle with in formulating this doctrine. And you see, every time a mistruth about the Trinity pops up, Everyone thinks they have found a great original way to interpret it. Um, but since almost the beginning of Christianity, there have been flawed attempts to understand this complex idea and really reduce the mystery of God to something more palatable, right? <laughs> That's often people say, well, this is too hard to get our heads around, so let's make it simple. That often leads to heresy or wrong doctrine. You know, heresy isn't just doctrine that's wrong, it's doctrine that's really, really wrong, that's going to 
um, affect people's salvation potentially and mess up the church. So, um, so yeah, this doctrine of the Trinity is central to Christianity. It's a central belief. In fact, all of these statements of belief we're looking at this morning are central. That all Christians everywhere would agree on agree them, whatever denomination they're from. These are all central beliefs that really define Christianity. And the, and the doctrine of the Trinity is probably the most central of the central um, doctrines there. So, you know, some doctrines are uh, important, but um, Christians agree to disagree. But other doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is fully God, fully man, um, they're, they're absolutely central to the Christianity and to, and to have a difference of opinion about them, um, yeah, is, is not, not great. <laughs> but, um, but I encourage you to look through, look at the scriptural evidence for Jesus being God, look at it yourself so you know, so you're not just believing it because people have told you to. Um, now, now I want to look at two big words which may um, sound out there but you've actually heard them expressed before. You might not have heard the big words, but you have heard the ideas. I'm just giving them a name, right? And the first is Arianism, right? And what, so one early attempt to explain the Trinity was Arianism, which is what basically Jehovah's Witnesses believe today. And it said that Jesus was not fully God like the Father was. This belief was named after Arius, who lived in AD uh, 256 to 336, and, it was, and he was one of the first to advance this idea. And this position also denies that Jesus eternally existed with the Father before creation. And the main problem with Arianism is that there's so many verses that clearly state, as I've said before, that Jesus is fully God, and there are also many verses that teach that he existed before creation. So Arianism um, is one kind of distortion or one early attempt um, to try and understand the Trinity that went, went wry, <laughs> that denied the deity of Jesus and denied his pre-existence. Another inadequate explanation the early church rejected was modalism. And this is the idea that there is one God, but, but only one person who appears and this one God who is one person appears in three different forms or modes. Um, and this explanation, in some ways, it adequately explained how God was one, but didn't adequately explain how he was three. And a contemporary movement that embraces modalism today is oneness Pentecostal, is the oneness Pentecostal movement. Um, and I've had some interesting discussions with some leaders from, the, from this movement in New Zealand, so it's alive and well um, today. Um, this modalism kind of distortion of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now you might be saying to me, Chris, why are you talking about this all, all this old church history stuff, right? Um, no actual Christians believe this today. Well, today Christians can sometimes make the mistake of using analogies um, from our experience to help explain the Trinity. And interestingly enough, these analogies often fall into one of these early heresies. For instance, I'm not sure if you've um, heard this analogy used, right? Because, I mean, the Trinity, um, this understanding of one God, three persons, um, can be a bit hard to get our head around. So, we, you know, it's easy just to think, I know, I'll compare it to this and use this kind of example. Um, so, for instance, I'm not sure if you've heard this one. The Trinity has been compared to a clo clover leaf. Um, but the problem with this analogy is that God doesn't have parts, right? With a clover, clover a three, you know, a three-headed clover leaf, you could pull off one leaf, right, and still have two leaves left. However, with God, you cannot separate the Son from the Father or the Holy Spirit and still have God. They all share the same divine life and nature and can't be separated. I mean, have a think about what if if you've been grew up in the church or been a Christian for a while, what kind of analogies have you heard used you know I heard one guy um, unfortunately I was at a Bible college I was a little bit shocked about this but he used an egg to try and illustrate um, the Trinity and this <laughs> they also fall short the same issue of God doesn't have parts and the egg does have parts um, I mean what some illustrations you've heard used have a, have a think about them for a minute you know another illustration 
um, you may have heard is someone compares the Trinity to ice, water, and gas, right? Like it's H2O, but it can appear in the form of ice. Uh, you can obviously be in the state of ice or water or, or, or gas, right? H2O. Um, again, this, this, this analogy from, from creation falls down, doesn't it? Because, um, you know, you can't have that same H2O be gas, water, um, and ice at the same time, can you? So it's interesting, this analogy is actually modalism, this idea that um, it's the same thing, but it just appears in three different forms, right? So that, that analogy falls into modalism. The first one I talked to, to that God has different parts, it falls into a heresy called partism. Um, but yeah, this, all these analogies kind of fall down. Uh, why is that? Well, the problem with these models is they take something from creation and try to liken it to God. Um, how the, the problem is there is no thing like that is like God and his triunity and all of creation, right? So every analogy from this creation is going to fall down. Another one um, I heard as I was in a church and a woman got up and said, look, um, Christians are just confused about this thing about the Trinity. I'll explain it to you. It's really simple. And she started it by saying this. God is one person. <laughs> as soon as she said that, I was like, <laughs> alarm bells. And she said, God is one person. I'll give you an illustration. Um, my husband is one person, but he has three different roles. He's a husband, he's a father, and he's an electrician. I can't remember exactly what his job was, but, you know, he's a worker. Um, she said, just like my husband is one person, but has three different roles, um, that's like how God is, right? And fortunately, um, the pastor knew this wasn't quite right, <laughs> so we talked about it afterwards. Um, but um, but yeah, can you see what? Where does that illustration fall down? Do you think? What of these heresies does it fall into? Modalism again, right? That God's only one person, not three persons, and one person with three roles. No, God is three distinct persons: one God, three persons. So when we're explaining the Trinity, um, is <laughs> As tempting as it is to use a homely illustration to try and illustrate it to people when we're talking about it, um, we need to resist this. It's best to just stick with one God, three persons, and not try and um, give it, you know, like I taught theology for many years at a Bible college, and <laughs> I would always say to the class, don't use whole analogies, don't change the words of one person, uh, three persons, one God, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, but every if you say people will try and get creative with the Trinity and, and use different words and, and, and use illustrations, but no, stick with one God, three persons when we're explaining the Trinity. So that being the case, as we've looked at over church history, the various um, explanations that fell short of the biblical data. Um, so the early church arrived with this model of one God and three persons. So is there a way that we can go a bit further and think about God as uh, one God and three persons? There are actually some really useful theological models to help us understand a little bit deeper this mystery of the Trinity and help it make a bit more sense. You know, in the 20th century, there was a revival in the theology around the Trinity and so much has been written about the the, um, the Trinity in the last, um, I don't know, yeah, since the 20th century and now the 21st century. So there, there's a lot being thought about and um, written about the Trinity. Now, one model that is useful is thinking of the Trinity as a society, a complex of persons who, who, who are, have a one being. And the Bible tells us that God is love in 1 John 4 verse 8, right? God is love. So love is the binding relationship between each member of the Trinity. Millard Erickson states, it, states that love is such a powerful dimension of God's nature that it binds three persons so closely that they are actually one, right? So love is, binds each person of the Trinity together. I'll read that quote from Erickson again. Love is such a powerful dimension of God's nature that it binds three persons so closely that they are actually one. If you think about this some more, the fact that God is love actually requires him to be more than one person. 
Love, to be real, must have a subject and an object to truly be love and not be mere um, narcissistic self-love. If God, think about it for a minute, if God was only one person, then it is hard to see how he could have been love before, um, before creation because there were no other persons for him to give love and receive love from before he created this universe and the other persons that are in it, right? But if God is love and three and exists as three persons before creation, then the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father, the Son loved the Spirit, the Spirit loved the Father, etc. And God could express and experience this divine love between the different persons of the Trinity. <clears throat> right? So I love to bring this argument out when I'm talking to Jehovah's Witness. I've asked them, how can God be love? Because that's what the Bible um, clearly teaches if he's not three persons. So an interesting question you might have thought, or may not have, but it, um, is, so could God exist as two persons instead of three, right? Why is God three persons, not two? Well, Perhaps this could be the case, but there is a dimension of openness and extension found in love between three persons that is not found in a love relationship between two persons that is more closed by nature. So this idea of the oneness of the persons of the Trinity is that of love may seem incorrect though if we think in terms of imperfect and limited human love. You know, when the Doctrine of the Trinity is talking about three persons. It's not talking about persons as in human persons in terms of our Western individualistic perspective on things, right? There's actually certain limitations that our human love has, but God doesn't have these um, limitations. So let's look at three of them. Let's look at three limitations that our human love has, because we're human, that God doesn't have and and what the nature of God's love between these members of the Trinity is like. So firstly, what's the first thing? So firstly, in human relationships, we are actually separated from each other by human bodies. I'm sure you've noticed that <laughs> before, right? We, um, but each member of the Trinity isn't separated by a physical body. You know, the, the human um, physical separation we have, the physical separation that we have as humans, um, actually helps us to distinguish from each other, right? Like if we're all just spirits floating around and visible, well, A, we couldn't see each other, we couldn't distinguish uh, one individual from another, right? So bodies are quite useful for human beings, that we can, you know, I've got one body, you've got a different one, we can recognise each other, right? But it does have the disadvantage that because we're physical beings, we can only communicate at a finite rate through a particular medium. What's that medium? Well, the air, you know, through... Um, noise traveling um, and that communication rate is finite right I mean I don't know how many words a minute I'm talking right now but it's a finite rate right like I could increase it and talk really fast really really really, really fast like this and tell you lots of stuff but you know so increase the rate but it's always um, at an X, X number of words per minute and it's a limited bandwidth that I can communicate with you at God on the other hand doesn't have this limitation He's not limited by a physical body and is unlimited by space. So there is unlimited communication between each member of the Trinity. Unlimited and instantaneous commu communication or bandwidth, if you will. So, so when we talk about God being three persons, it's not in this human sense of having bodies and limited um, communication. It's unlimited communication, no physical bodies. A second factor that separates human persons is different experiences, right? You know, sometimes, have you ever had a big chat to someone and you just really, um, maybe you think you understand what they're talking about, but then they say something else and you go, where are they coming from? You just don't connect, right? It's really hard to get inside someone's head, right? Because we all have such different upbringings, experiences, perspective on the world, um, and because of our different life experiences, we can often misinterpret what, is, what someone is saying and where they're coming from. You know, these different experiences are actually a further barrier to true communication between different human persons. But God, on the other hand, doesn't have this problem. 
each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not only experiences what the others are currently experiencing, but has also experienced all that each member has ever experienced. Think of that. God is, the, the, like the Father doesn't go, ah, oh, to the Holy Spirit, well, I had a different experience to you. No, they've had, they, I'll read that again. Each member of the Trinity not only experiences what the others are currently experiencing, but has also experienced all that each member has ever experienced, right? <sighs> Blow your mind. <laughs> and then the final one, before I completely blow our minds, um, a third separating factor with us humans is our preoccupation with our own needs and our own self, which makes it hard for us to empathize with others or place ourselves in other people's shoes, right? But it's different with God. Because God is other orientated and is completely secure in himself, each member of the Trinity gives of themselves and identifies fully with each other member of the Godhead. <laughs> so yeah, whereas we humans find it hard to get outside ourselves because of our focus on our own needs and self, that isn't the case with God. So now you, some of you may be saying, what about Jesus? So that is one major qualification to all, all of this. When Jesus added humanity to his divinity, when he became fully human 2,000 years ago, However, because Jesus remains fully divine and never ceased to be God, he is still a divine human person. So it still applies to Jesus. So in summary of this model, <laughs> one useful model I've found um, is to think of God as a society, a complex of persons who, who are, however, are one being. He is one being bonded in love, and each person of the Trinity is unlimited by space, so has instantaneous and unlimited communication, experiences and has experienced everything all the other members do, and is other orientated in the divine life throws through each member of the Trinity. So hopefully I didn't hurt your brain too much, but I've found that theological model very useful in trying to make sense of and go a bit deeper in the mystery of the Trinity. So to finish with, how does this understanding of who God is and an understanding of his triunity affect our everyday lives? Well, firstly, our relationship with God is not with one person. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> it's with three persons, three divine persons. We have a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each is deserving of our praise and worship. And having a relationship with God is about being drawn further into intimacy with each member of the Godhead. Now this isn't to say that we can't address God as one, because as we've seen, God is a unity and one, but we're also never alone. So we don't just have a me and God type individualistic relationship. Since God is a divine community, we are loved by one God and three persons at the same time. So I think that first point is we're in a relationship with one God, but three persons is really important implication for our relationship with God, which is um, central to the life of a Christian. Secondly, if God is a trinity, it actually has implications for all of reality. Um, if there was no God and no spiritual realm, then reality is fundamentally physical, and the primary force holding everything together is electromagnetic. This means that human relationships are just an illusion. They're just a freak chemical reaction, and they ultimately have no ultimate meaning. However, if the fundamental, if reality is fundamentally social, because God is a divine community of love, then love is the most powerful force that binds persons together. Obviously, it's the most powerful force that binds the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together. It binds God together, but it, as we are made in his image, it also binds us together as human beings, and ultimately us and God, that love he has for us, and we return. So, reality itself is fundamentally socially you know, knowing an infinite but personal God is not impossible, as some will claim. You know, so have you ever heard a non-Christian say to you, well, no one can know there's a God? Well, wrong. If the ultimate reality 
is social because God is the Trinity, then actually the most fundamental thing we can do is know God, right? Because that's what we've been created for. We've been designed for a relationship with him. And um, reality is fundamentally social. So I think that has huge implications. Um, and those kind of implications flow on into other areas as well, right? It means that all human relationships are not meaningless as they are if atheism is true. But our relationship with God and other humans is of ultimate and eternal importance. And human societies and human society as a whole ultimate ideal is actually the divine community of the Trinity. And this changes everything, or it should. And this kind of flows through to my third point. You know, so what, what does this mean for us? What is the fact that God's a Trinity and that God's one God, three persons? What does that mean for us? Well, thirdly, God as a divine community is the ultimate model for all human community, including the church. You know, God's love, equality, and perfect communication and community as, as a divine community of love is also our model for how we should live in Christian community and the church. You know, every person is of equal importance. Why? Because God is co-equal and a co-eternal divine community. Um, and therefore, every in human community, there's an equality likewise because we're made in God's image. And, as a, and we're not just made as individuals, but we're made for relationship with each other and ultimately God. Now, we often take this idea of the equality of an equal value of every person for granted in our Western society because it still stresses this, this human equality and value and dignity so much. But the only true firm foundation for this belief is a Christian Trinitarian understanding of God, right? What, under naturalism, the idea that all there is is the physical universe, <laughs> um, we're just a freak of nature. We're just a, we're just a random bunch of atoms, right? And there's no basis for the equality of all human beings. But if God's a trinity and he's made us in, it, in our image and so we're all valuable and important in human community, then that's the basis for the equality and value of every person in community and as individuals. So in church and in practice, this means that in church, every person's gifts and perspective is important. You know, Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 24 um, to 25 and the second part of verse 24 he says but God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that it should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other you know this is true in church we should be careful very careful that we act differently in church that we reflect this this equal value um, that we all have is in the body of Christ. And as Paul says that, you know, as he talks about in this whole passage of 1 Corinthians 12, the parts that lack it, right, God actually gives greater honour to, we should draw greater attention to, rather than the parts that naturally um, seem to have more honour, you know, like the people up the front, the leaders, etc. Um, and I think we've got to be very careful here because it's easy to fall into emulating the world, right? Um, and I'm not saying everyone in the world does this, but in general, the world values people for what you know job they can do, right? What's the first thing we ask when we meet someone? What job do you do, right? Um, or how great their contribution to society is. And in the church, um, I'm not saying that leadership isn't important because the scriptures talk a lot about leadership, but it's always servant leadership, i.e. leadership that serves first. And so we should be careful that we're not valuing a particular gifting whether it be leadership or preaching above other parts of the body of christ and we should be very careful about self-importance or you know um, big titles um, creeping into the way we do church or the way we structure things um, yeah so i think that's a really important implication of the doctrine of the trinity and then finally the trinity provides our ultimate model for christian mission you know, God is attempting to draw all that are willing of creation into his divine community of love. So what does that mean? Well, that means that mission, outreach, evangelism is fundamentally relational. It's ultimately God's work of drawing people into his triune love. 
but he uses us to lovingly preach the gospel to people and gently show them their need for, give, for forgiveness and for a relationship with God. Not try and win an argument or aggressively or harshly preach to them, right? Because mission at its heart is about God drawing all of creation that's willing into community with himself, then um, our, the very task of mission is based on that and influenced by that. And so mission and evangelism is ultimately fundamental, fundamentally relational. So yeah, um, in a minute, a few uh, questions for you to discuss are going to appear over there. Um, but let me just pray as we finish today. Yeah, Jesus, thank you as we've explored this vast topic. I pray that um, I hope um, that we've been challenged, that we've learned something from your word, from the truth of who you are as one God and three persons. And um, I pray that you'd help us to see the implications for our relationship with you, for others, for the equality of every person in the body of Christ, in human society in general, because they're made in your image. So thank you for your incredible love you have for us and that love you had for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit between all of you before the creation of the world. And thank you that you're drawing all of us um, that are willing into, um, into that community of love. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for the truth of your word and for you and you revealing yourself, even if it's hard to get our heads around at first, that you are one God and three persons. And, um, and we can have um, intimacy with, with, with you, Lord God, and you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I thank you for that. And um, yeah, just give us, um, bless our week, give us an awesome week. And as we talk about this further, give us further insight in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Have a fantastic week. God bless. And the questions will be here in a minute.